Hello from the Center for Livable Cities and a warm welcome to the 13th episode in our CLC webinar series, Cities Adapting to a Disrupted World. I'm your host, Dinesh Naidu. Today's webinar is titled Hi. Resilient Rotterdam, Green City Lungs for COVID Recovery. But before we dive in, some housekeeping. Simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin is available for this webinar. To access this, please click on the interpretation tab on your Zoom toolbar and then select Chinese. Now today's speakers are Mr. Ahmed Abu Taleb, the Mayor of Rotterdam, Mr. Jaya Ratnam, Singapore's Ambassador to Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and the European Union. Ambassador will lead Mayor in a fireside chat on Rotterdam's plans to build more green public spaces in response to COVID-19. Now we've received questions for the Mayor during registration and you can also continue to pose questions using the Q&A tab in the Zoom toolbar. I'm now honored to welcome and introduce our speakers. His Excellency Ahmed Abu Taleb has been mayor of Rotterdam since 2009. His former roles include State Secretary for the Ministry of Social Affairs and Employment and Vice Mayor in Amsterdam for the Dutch Labour Party. Uh, mayor Abu Talab is a close friend of the World City Summit and WCS Mayor's Forum, and he was due to speak at the World City Summit in 2020, so we are very glad that he has agreed to join us today. I'm also honoured to welcome Mr. Jaya Ratnam, Ambassador to Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, as well as the European Union. Ambassador has served in various capacities in Europe, Southeast Asia, international organisations, and consular directorates in Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has also served at the Singapore missions in Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, Brunei, and to the United Nations in Geneva. Ambassador J. R. Ratnam was awarded Singapore's Silver Public Administration Medal in 2012 and Long Service Medal in 2014. Now, without further ado, Ambassador J. R. Ratnam, the mic is yours. A very good morning to all from Brussels. Uh, we, we know that uh, we have uh, many friends from across different time zones, but a very special welcome to His Excellency Mayor Abu Taleb. Uh, we are very honoured that he could join us here today to speak to us about how resilient Rotterdam is adapting to disruptions caused by COVID-19 and getting back on its feet. As many are aware here, and Dinesh re uh, referenced this, Mayor Abu Taleb has been a steadfast partner of the World City Summit for these past years, a keen promoter of Singapore-Netherlands relations, but first and foremost, he's a proud and passionate advocate of his beloved Rotterdam. As port cities, Singapore and Rotterdam are tied by an umbilical cord of trade, not just in goods and services, but ideas. Singapore delegations of every level, size and department have descended on Rotterdam during the past four odd years that I've been here as ambassador to learn more about what makes resilience work in Rotterdam. The obvious highlight of this was the state visit by um, President Halima Yaakob in 2018, which the mayor hosted, uh, hosted her in Rotterdam. For Singapore, the attraction to Rotterdam is obvious. First, Rotterdam is a city that is constantly reinventing itself to adjust to changing and circumstances, which has kept itself vital and relevant for centuries. Second, it is a multicultural, multi-religious urban centre, which is a home as well as a business centre. And third, and more importantly, it works. The mayor makes sure of that. I've had the opportunity to walk the ground with the mayor when he showed Minister Masagos how community policing works. I spent the day cycling across Rotterdam with DPM Heng Sri Kiet, who wanted to understand from the perspective of a resident in Rotterdam how urban planning works. COVID-19 has hit all of us hard, with Europe grappling with successive waves right now. But let us get started today and hear from Mayor Abu Talib how Rotterdam is responding to this crisis, getting back on its feet stronger and better. Mayor Abu Talib, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the people all over the world listening to this uh, webinar. And thank you for Singapore and Centre for Livable Cities for hosting me today. COVID-19 is a drama for the world, and, um, uh, but one day we will recover. And then uh, the idea that we had developed in the city is how can we prepare for the moment that 
the city and the world hopefully will be COVID free. And um, the idea that we developed and myself primarily is we have to, go, to give from the very beginning a signal of hope to the city. But a signal of hope um, is not enough. A signal of hope must be followed by uh, providing perspective. So it's um, the, the first chapter of our budget uh, plan for the next year is given uh, the title Hope and Perspective. Hope um, means that you um, um, have the duty as a city to keep everyone connected, everyone. Because uh, if there is a, a group that is targeted by COVID and hits most, that are the traditional groups, people with a low social economic status. They are not able to work home. Rotterdam is a city of physics, physical economy. Containers coming in, containers going out. A lot of logistics, uh, physical labor. So these people cannot work home. It's not like Amsterdam with the bank sector or the lawyers um, alley in the southern part of the city. We have to deliver physical labor. So a lot of people living in the south bank of the city are hit by, um, by COVID-19, um, more than the average in, in the country. And I'm happy that nowadays, since a, a week or, or, or two, the numbers are, are, are coming down and that is, that, that's, um, that's a good signal for the city. You are now on the level of about 250 um, uh, cases a day. Um, compared to large cities in the world, it's still a small number. But on the other hand, if you uh, have to tackle um, this virus and in the meantime to support um, uh, people that are losing the job by giving them enough financial support to survive, you have to give the city a perspective. And then we decided to give the city a perspective by investing in green areas, making the city green. Um, you may know if you have a port, uh, with a length of 40 kilometers, with a lot of industry and a lot of containers. We have the largest um, um, refineries in the world, uh, so we produce a lot of pollution. We are good for about 18%, 1.8% of the pollution in the country. So it's our duty here in the city uh, to do something about that. So um, by making the city green, designing seven major products in the city, we hope to uh, give a signal that we continue to be a green city, to reduce the heat stress in the city, but also to make the city attractive. In the meantime, to create jobs for people to work in creating these zones, and by making the city attractive, you attract investments and you encourage um, the, the, the construction sector to build more houses and more apartments, which we are urgently in need for in, in the city. So hope and perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think hope and perspective is something that we all need right now. Uh, I think this is a good time um, uh, before we go into your seven cities project portfolio to reveal the poll question uh, and the outcome of the results of this poll. Uh, the question is, will investing in parks and open public spaces help cities recover from COVID-19? Uh, and uh, I think our, all our respondents have taken this poll and and the outcome is, uh, oh, yes, sorry. Uh, the outcome is, oh, a, a clear outcome of 92% uh, say yes. Uh, that is uh, no surprise. Could you tell us, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, how does the Seven Cities project contribute to Rotterdam in general and dealing with the current crisis? Well, first of all, um, the, the, the projects are designed uh, to um, uh, give the city uh, a green shape. We are an industrial city. We have a lot of water, uh, former port areas that are now empty. That means that we are able to give another destination to this former port area. That means uh, that there's space for um, making these places green and by making them green, they become attractive for investors to invest in um, uh, housing constructions, but also offices and hotels and all the, all the other stuff. The construction itself creates jobs. But um, we count here in the city that one apartment is good for two permanent jobs. So if you build, and our aim is to build 4,000 apartments a year, uh, that is 8,000 jobs in permanent. Uh, so that, that's other, this other statistics. You are now looking to a picture in downtown Rotterdam. 
uh, underneath this green area is uh, that we will create is a garage. There used to be a garage for cars that is now connected with another garage under the ground. But we'll separate this garage partly uh, to create um, a, a parking uh, facility for bicycles. We have had the two fronts in the Netherlands in 2010. That was a major event. And now we have a tremendous amount of people that use the bike. We took 6,000 parking lots out of downtown, 6,000 parking lots to make space for bicycles and for pedestrians and philosophy to make a city more attractive. And we know nowadays from the economy, the people that um, do shopping in downtown are not the ones with cars. Those are pedestrians and people with bicycles. That is the new knowledge in the economy. In the beginning, it was a, a big fight with the entrepreneurs that said, don't take these parking lots, we need them, our clients can be car. Don't forget it. Nobody's coming to downtown to buy a, a refrigerator. All people buy these big things via internet and things are delivered home. But the city, downtown, must be um, an attractive, leisure place with cafes and bars and green areas. But that means that we need also to reduce the heat stress in those areas, which is a relevant indicator, as you may know from the philosopher of C40. Downtowns in the world are hot places and we need to reduce, to reduce heat. So it's, this plan is um, tackling the heat stress. It's making city, the city attractive by um, um, making these parks and green areas we create immediate jobs, but in the long term, when the city becomes attractive, then the developers will invest in these uh, immediate facilities of these green areas, and that creates permanent jobs for the city. That is really the second uh, approach in, our, in my um, introduction. That's the perspective. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it is certainly an ambitious project which resonates with Singapore, uh, given our own aspirations uh, in terms of be being a, a city in, in a garden. Of the seven projects, is there any one that you would like to highlight as particularly significant? Yeah, that, that is um, the mass half and the project. You, you will see it. That's, um, uh, for me, on, on the right, uh, on the screen, um, the funny thing about this, this park is that we will take out um, from the map of the city um, a place that is now used uh, by um, uh, um, uh, vessels connecting Germany with the Netherlands. We have a lot of these um, vessels, but we have a lot of space on the water. So they, they may lose part of, this, of, this, of, the, of, of the port. And this uh, park will be constructed um, on the south bank of the city that is the less favorite uh, part of the city um, uh, in terms of the uh, of, of economy and, and jobs. But that's the place where we built uh, uh, within a couple of years, a new football stadium, um, some uh, three, 4,000 new houses. And this park is designed by the citizens themselves. I have seen in one of the questions, how can you um, decide about the amenities and everything that you need in such a park? Well, by uh, introducing the term co-creation. This park has been co-created by citizens and the engineers of, this, of the city. It's a huge space um, in, an, in, in a stoned area, in a place where there is a lot of uh, houses, or streets, where there is no uh, space for young kids to play. And then having such a park in the immediate vicinity um, can really create an opportunity for the citizens to go out and to use the green spaces for uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, issues. And um, the south bank of the city is also a part where the life perspective of citizens is the average of two years, less than the average in the city. That has to do with um, health issues. Um, people that are not able to um, um, exercise, to go out, to walk. Um, and uh, the combination of a lot of variables make that the life perspective for the citizens is the average, on the average is two years um, lower than the average of the, of the city. So this will be a wonderful gift to the city and we will start uh, building that hopefully next year. Mr. Mayor, it certainly sounds like a project that will benefit everybody in Rotterdam. I would like to start taking some questions from the audience uh, we have received during the registration process and one of which is from uh, Diana Al Alam from Rotterdam. 
she asks, what are the challenges faced in building more green public spaces and how are they addressed? Mr. Mayor, can you share a little bit more on this? Yeah, well, well the challenge uh, is always, um, I would like to make the whole city green. The, the challenge is always the money. Um, this um, seven um, projects uh, will cost some 370 million euros. Um, that is in dollars a bit more, but that is really a, a, a great, um, um, a great amount of, of money. Is if you if you if you know that the budget of the city is about four billion euros, then this is really a substantial portion of it. So it's indeed having enough um, enough uh, enough money, and the other is having enough space. You see that this park will be created on the water. That means that um, on the south bank there is not enough space. Uh, to invest in such a park. So it's money and space. Thank you. We have another question, uh, this time from uh, Zurich. Uh, uh, Noemi Prost. And, and, and the question uh, is, uh, are those public spaces also designed to retain stormwater runoff, enhance biodiversity, reduce urban heat? I suppose uh, another way is how are these projects uh, are designed to address issues such as climate change? Yeah, well, I told you in one of my introduction to Marx that uh, uh, in downtown, the, one of the aims is to reduce uh, heat stress. That is directly connected to the climate issue. The second is um, we used to have flood in downtown. That is over, thanks to having water storage systems. Um, underneath one of the major garages, not far from the central station, we have a storing capacity of millions and millions of liters of water. So when it's, there is heavy rain um, and the um, uh, water, the drainage system is not, um, uh, uh, is not capable to bring the water to the river, we store the water first in, a, uh, in an underground system. And then when the rain is over within a couple of days, uh, when there is capacity in the, um, in the drain system, then we bring the water through pumping to the river. Um, so the, um, we used to tackle that issue years ago by building a water storage system. We have two of them. The one is uh, next, the first one is uh, not far from the museum, Boymans from Berningen, and the other one is um, just in front of the central uh, station. Uh, but the, all the plans that our engineers are designing for um, redeveloping or developing uh, the city uh, are checked um, sometimes by me, myself, uh, on the issues of do they contribute to managing the water. Uh, that's really important and that means that we have to use um, um, the pavement on the sidewalk that is uh, perused to let the water get into the ground and sometimes just to use less stones in the public space and to use more green spaces to manage the water. Now you have a question from Singapore. Uh, Joyce Lim from Singapore would like to know how does, how do you as the government get buy-in from citizens for, the, for your projects? So, uh, a good question for a lot of city governors and city uh, mayors and, and other officials, not to me. My concept of working in the city of Rotterdam is working with citizens. So I, um, I'm now 12 years in office and uh, the city uh, council recently decided to um, um, uh, give me an opportunity of an additional six years. Um, what I did before COVID-19 is every week, I had a meeting somewhere in one of the neighborhoods, um, um, primarily vulnerable neighborhoods, but also uh, other neighborhoods. Um, so I was also myself actively seeking for citizens, seeking for criticism, because criticism is free advice. Uh, that's my concept of dealing with, um, uh, with the needs of citizens. And um, the answers are not always yes. Um, Frequently, the answers are, no, I'm not going to do it, because the wish of one individual is not always the wish of the whole neighborhood. So it's really uh, complicated, but it's really funny to go to the citizens and to take vice mayors with me, the chief of the police when it comes to security issues, but also the chief prosecutor when it comes to prosecution. And then um, we come back with a lot of ideas. And those ideas help us to shape the policy. And then when we shape the policy, when we create a plan, then we go back again to uh, the citizens and we tell them um, after our consultations with you, this is what we think that is 
could fourth this neighborhood, do you agree? This is the process we do that. And I, um, since this year, I decided to do something different, uh, which means that I spent uh, one day a week working in what the most vulnerable uh, uh, neighborhood of the city, every Friday. Uh, I go there, um, I meet citizens, I meet the city officials, we make plans. And the funny thing is I invited one of the newspapers um, to join us in this process, a national newspaper, um, no um, 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 problems at all, that they um, stay with us during sometimes very sensitive meetings with citizens. Um, and they uh, publish in the newspaper, that's the Volkskant. So far they published two major issues, two pages um, uh, about the way we try to learn from citizens and to uh, together to create something, uh, something new, whether it's safety, security, green areas, uh, trees, but also uh, in this uh, neighborhood, a lot of people from Eastern Europe, uh, from Poland and from Bulgaria that work there with a lot of complex social issues. Um, and then, um, so not only going back to your office and, le and learning in, in the documents, in the official documents, what the problems are, but if you as mayor leave the problems with the citizens, you will be able to make other decisions than only when you learn the um, the, um, uh, the the issues about uh, about citizens from um, from Excel sheets. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are getting questions fast and furious. Um, I, I would like to pose one question uh, from Mr. Arisman and also um, from Mr. Shamuga Ratnam from uh, Hanoi. Uh, essentially, it, it relates to space crunch and uh, limited space it, where yeah. land costs are high and extremely valuable. How do you make sure green lungs can be viable in such an environment? Um, that's not an easy thing. I mean, uh, in all cities, um, um, if, uh, and I have been in Ho Chi Minh City, for instance, and I know the water problems over there. Um, in all cities, it's really very difficult um, because the, the government then must decide to take out uh, uh, one or two streets, uh, what to do with citizens living over there. Um, um, but nevertheless, I will be really in favor of doing such actions if the perspective for that um, part of the city is good. And then we're then talking about double or three double use of land. Um, double use of land, that's the example that I show you, having a garage underneath and green space on top, a double use of land. But you may also do that in um, using such a space in having a garage underneath, having a square of green and then surrounded by houses. If you succeed in creating a convenience, a dialogue with citizens that you take them out from that street or two streets, um, one or two years, provide them temporary shelter somewhere else, and they have the perspective of coming back to a very nice apartment with a balcony looking on the green space, that is a matter of dialogue uh, between citizens and, and, and governments. That's not an easy thing to do, and has also to do with the level of trust. Do the citizens really trust um, um, the governments that they will act? I have seen a good example of that in Jakarta. Uh, there was a very old um, area uh, full of prostitution and crime, etc. that has been uh, taken out by the, the governor, the former governor. They created new houses and new green spaces and the former citizens um, granted the opportunity to come back to the former living area. So th that there are good examples in the world. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Coming back to our uh, problems that we are facing today, uh, Mr. Kwan Ok Lee asked how public space can, which could be a hotspot for virus spreads if densities are high. How do you plan to address this uh, when you organize uh, the, the green spaces? You cannot change the shape of a city overnight, even not by design in a court of an age. You cannot do that. So uh, what you can do is um, in terms of um, um, uh, in infectious diseases like COVID-19, that's really um, creating uh, facilities for citizens um, to escape the virus. You cannot, um, in, 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 in uh, high density uh, streets, with um, apartments of 50 or 60 meters, uh, with families of six people, 
even if there is a need for quarantine or for personal isolation because one of the members of this family has been contracted the virus, it's really difficult for such a family um, to um, cope with the restrictions coming from, uh, from the government, even if they want. So that is really um, um, a, um, a variable that we have to take uh, into consideration. That's why um, if that is not the, the way to find the solution, um, that's why I suggested to the national government to introduce a system of 100% um, screening, 100% testing. Um, and if we can do that every month, for instance, in such neighborhoods with collaboration of citizens, that is the best way to prevent um, um, citizens in those vulnerable neighborhoods from contracting the virus. Um, places in the world with high density of citizens, small apartments, streets, you cannot um, defeat the virus uh, through investing in social economic indicators or green areas. That's not the investment that will lead to a solution. Then the solution must be found into fighting the virus through a medical system. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, Mr. Yahweh Chen would like to come back to your point about finance. Uh, what is the financial mechanisms that you think is possible in terms of investing in green areas and uh, how have you tried to attract uh, private investors and uh, other financial resources to finance such projects besides uh, public investment? Well, shaping the public space, um, in my opinion, is a public duty. So that's not for private parties. Uh, but we are lucky in the city to have um, uh, two institutions. Um, one of them was um, making a lot of money in the past, um, um, bringing tourists from Rotterdam to New York, and they made really a fortune and they decided to give back to the city. And that means they invest uh, per year tens of millions of euros for, uh, in the city, either social project, but also green project. And one of the um, projects that this private partner is invested in it is uh, Park de Uromast. That's um, where the Uromast is, um, is built um, in, the, in, the east, in the western part of the city. Um, this private entity will invest there and give, give something in return for the, uh, for the city. But the seven projects will be really just um, finances organized by the city itself. We're well, lucky now in Europe, in the Netherlands, to see that you can get bank loans for very, very low charges, um, less than 1%. Um, so we um, activate, as we call it in our system, we activate that in our budget system, and then we um, uh, 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 talk with banks and, and have loans for less than 1% charge, um, and we pay these loans back in 15 years' time. That's a a valid system that we have, I think, uh, for, uh, for years, uh, and that works very good. Uh, and that's not a very difficult to get these loans. The banks have a lot, a lot of money, um, and there is a little um, uh, tendency in society to invest, so they have a lot of money uh, to spend in uh, projects, and so the, um, the, the, the charges are very, very low, and we are a trusted government, so it's not difficult to get these loans. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, on that. Uh, we have one question on the, um, on the arts and museums and culture. How can this be integrated into the green space, uh, which goes to bringing in the citizens? That's a great, great question. That's really a great question. Uh, if there is something that we can learn from Paris, is that all the... Uh, um, uh, art institutions are connected with sometimes really small um, gardens and sometimes with small parks, not always um, uh, very big um, uh, in, uh, in, in Paris. We are now um, the phase of uh, uh, reconstruction of the largest museum of the city, Boymas van Beuningen. Uh, the cost of that project will be uh, some uh, 300 million euros. Uh, and part of it is uh, indeed um, to uh, redesign the garden behind the museum. Um, so far, it's a, um, uh, uh, I should say, a shabby garden designed somewhere in the 70s, and we would like to make it a, a, a modern uh, garden with uh, additional entrances, but also to create a, a space for uh, large events that can cater for, for 5,000 people. Um, one of the events in that garden is 
um, on group watching movies in the night um, uh, through uh, headsets. Um, that's, um, that's an event that, that, that people organize uh, there. It's really, uh, really, really important. And I think that if you have the opportunity and the space uh, and the money to do something like, uh, like this, renovating the museum and then redesigning the garden, uh, that's always good. Um, and people go to the museum, if they go two hours to a museum, they spend, I think, uh, that's the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the figures that we have, two hours to a museum, they spend 45 minutes uh, watching, uh, watching art, uh, and then the rest of the time they spend watching the building, um, going to the restaurant, drinking some coffee, and look in the environment. So um, I think it's a, a good connection to make the city attractive. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have time for one last question, uh, which I shall exercise my right and ask that question. Uh, just listening to, to, to you from all of this and to bring this all together, can I just ask the question, what is the role of leadership, city leadership? Uh, how do you actually exercise this leadership? I think that's something we all can learn from. Uh, you have so much experience uh, over the years that, that you have built up. You know, I um, distinguish in, in terms of leadership, um, two types of leadership. We have the leadership um, of people that are um, leading because they have been elected. Um, um, they are the result of democratic elections. So uh, my prime minister, Mark Rutte, um, is our national leader and he is elected and he is the result of um, um, a, a democratic process. I'm not. Uh, I'm not elected by the citizens. I'm, um, there is a vote about my candidacy in the city council. And so I need trust from the city council. And the space that I have to maneuver is the space that is given to me uh, by the, um, the, the, the city council as the highest uh, organism in our political system. But there is another type of leadership. That's what I call natural leadership. And that's not the same as being the authority given by law. Um, the major things I do are not based on any law. They are based on, um, um, hopefully, on being a kind of a natural leader in the city and being complementary to the political system, not replacing the political system. And so gaining the trust in society, gaining the trust of our prime minister and the national government, being the one that is um, able to talk to the prime minister, to all ministers, uh, to the private institutions, to the banks, to all the cultural institutions, the educational sector, the academia, being accepted as a natural person, as a natural authority, um, um, uh, is a major uh, proposition to push the city forward without having um, formal authority given by, uh, by law. And I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I can do that um, uh, thanks to the person I am. So it's not the, the authority that is given to me, but the person I am and the natural uh, character that is that's put in place. And I'm learning when it comes to how to do that from people like uh, one of your neighbors, um, Gandhi. Uh, that was not an elected man, that was a natural leader. And this type of characters, I, I really love it and I try to use this type of skills. Um, to help the city and its democracy forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Both you and Rotterdam have, have been inspirational for all the rest of us. We look forward to carrying on our relationship with you and Rotterdam in the future. Thank you so much for taking the time today to speak to us and giving us such a comprehensive briefing of what's happening. Thank you both. Uh, I found the description of Rotterdam City Park projects very inspiring from the scale of these projects to the vision of the city uh, that you painted, Mr. Mayor, through both words and those powerful visions. Equally fascinating were Mayor's insights on engaging the community and the role of leadership. And thank you, Ambassador, for that great last question in particular. Uh, thank you both for sharing your time with us today. All right, this will be our last webinar for this year, and we will resume the series in February 2021. In the meantime, we are pleased to announce our World City Summit 2021 launch event, which will be held on the afternoon Singapore time of Friday the 29th of January. This event will feature an in-conversation fireside chat with Indrani Raja, Singapore's Minister in the Prime Minister's Office and Second Minister for Finance and National Development, together with Dr. Chong Kun Hin, Executive, Chief Executive Officer of the Housing and Development Board of Singapore. 
There will also be a media conference, as well as sessions on the role of technology, as well as real estate. Some of our confirmed speakers include um, Dr. Mike Short, Chief Scientific Officer at the UK Department of International Trade, David Wallerstein, Chief Exploration Officer of Tencent, and Ms. Huang Yuning, Chief Planner and Deputy CEO at Singapore's Urban Redevelopment Authority. We hope you will join us then, and please look out for more details in our mailers and website. This, website, this webinar has been live streamed on CLC's Facebook page, and we'll upload a recording of it tomorrow on our CLC YouTube channel, where you can find over 500 other videos, including this video on living with water lessons from Rotterdam. Finally, thank you to you, dear viewers, for staying with us for the past 13 webinars. For one last time this year, please use the QR code or link to fill in our feedback form before you leave. Do tell us what works and how we can do better. We've come to the end of today's webinar, but we'll be leaving this room open for another five minutes, and we hope that uh, Ambassador Jairatnam and Mayor Abu Taleb might be able to stay and exchange messages with some of the audience for a while. Uh, please join them if you can. Until our next event on the 29th of January, happy holidays and stay healthy.